Welcome everyone, and thank you so much for coming to our Texas Book Chat Live event. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. The restrooms are down the hall on your left, and we will take questions at the end of the session, so please hold your questions until then. Uh, Michael will be available at the conclusion of our event to sign books if you brought those with you. And we also have a special treat for you. Uh, Peggy Price, Education Court Outreach Coordinator for the Archives and Information Services Division here at the library, has brought some selected items from the collection related to the history of Boston on the table there that you can view after the talk. And she's happy to talk with you about the library and archives resources here. So now to the reason we're all here today, I'm so delighted to welcome author and journalist Michael Barnes. Michael is a native Texan who earned his PhD from the University of Texas at Austin. For the Austin American Statesman, for many years, he's written about the city's people, places, culture, and history, and he's the author of four volumes of Indelible Austin, published by the Austin History Association and Waterloo Press. That's a welcome. Um, so how did, how did this book series come about? This is number four, and I know number five is on the way. It is. Um, so how do you decide which ones of your Austin history articles for the statesmen are included in each volume? Good question. So I uh, had started writing seriously about history in the paper um, by accident about 10 years ago. Uh, I've had a lot of different beats of papers, readers know. And uh, it all started with uh, Ken McKnight, who works over in Parks and Recreation. And at the time, she was a consultant for the uh, uh, Parks Department on history and on their archaeological treasures. And so we did this little series for a whole year, just tiny little stories about what you might stumble on in Austin Parks, including the lime kiln at Reed Park, which came up in a conversation earlier today. But, um, but what we found out that year was that readers loved history. And we just didn't know that. And I think before it often had been consigned to a specialist, you know, who either talked above the readers or wrote above the readers or below or whatever. But we were able to find a sweet spot. And eventually, after writing a lot of, of stories, um, uh, readers began to ask if there would be a book lecture. So this was about 10 years ago. And I said, mm -hmm. Books are hard. Uh, I don't know if I want to do a book. I love books. You know, we have about 3,500 of them in our house. But uh, my husband's a retired book editor, so I know how much work they are. And I said, you know, you think there's an audience for books? Is there? <laughs> is, would people buy it? And so uh, we had a couple of uh, dear friends over at the uh, University of Texas Press, and I, I asked in you know, an email, just like, well, what, who would I talk to about this? And they said, mm, this is not really our, our area. And of course, they said that to everybody, but <laughs> I didn't mind. And so I was like, OK, so I tried. <laughs> I'm not going to pick it up anymore. But then, um, uh, the people over at the Austin History Center Association had heard that I was doing that. And they said, well, we'd like it to be part of our Waterloo Press series. And um, Waterloo Press was started in the early 1970s, if I'm correct. And it has been uh, an imprint on and off since then. And so, wonderful uh, editor Kathleen Davis Neendorf who uh, helped me put together the first volume and uh, so we were surprised that we had to go into a second printing Yay. within a few months and now we have to do a third printing the first first volume is is once again out uh, and so um, now uh, how, how do I choose the ones that go in here into these books, I, I try to look at the ones that had the most response and had, and that read like they'd be in a book. Because a lot of things we write in newspapers, you know, <laughs> as a former statesman reporter, 
they don't belong in a book. You know, they're not that interesting. They do not stand the test of time. So, um, uh, luckily, history is evergreen, and so it's news whenever anybody reads one of these because it's the first time that they're confronted with this. And so, also, I, I uh, organized them in themes. So, like, each chapter has a theme. Uh, like, for instance, ancestral families or legacy businesses or whatever. And so, what people tell me is that when they read the same stories here that they may have read in my column, they resonate differently, in part because they're in a book, so you read it differently, you're not about to toss it into the recycling. <laughs> but secondly, um, because they're organized in these things, you can read about a neighborhood like the Guadalupe neighborhood, and then another one about the, the uh, Holly Street neighborhood, and another one, and, and you see how they all fit together. So it helps make a larger story by having them in, in this kind of book form. Yeah, that uh, makes complete sense. And I also have read a lot of things in the paper and then uh, absorbed it differently here. And I know Kim McKnight from Austin High, she and Peter Stiles are in You know. Have a, have, kids are the same age, but anyway. So <laughs> you have become a curator of Austin history in many formats. Your columns for the Austin American Statesman your Think Texas digital newsletter, the Austin Found podcast, and the Indelible Austin books. So the, do the newsletter and the podcast spring from material you have researched for the books, or kind of what's the relationship between these different formats? Almost everything starts as uh, a story for the paper. Okay. Um, the podcast, Austin Found, which is still out there, you can hear it, and we, don't, we haven't updated it in a long time because my uh, co-star got laid off from <laughs> work. So, uh, he was the producer of the podcast as well, so that's why. It, but we did do 87 episodes, so I mean, that's not a small thing. And basically, they were based on the book version because J.D. or I would, J.D. Hager was my uh, uh, colleague on that, would pick out uh, a, a particular story and then we sit down and chat about it. And, and once the pandemic uh, uh, was, I mean, we were gonna have our first guest March of 2020. <laughs> so, but once the pandemic began to lift, we had, we had storytellers on, uh, great members of communities all over Austin that uh, I knew through uh, reporting about them. And our first guest was Eddie Wilson from Thread Guilds and the Armadillo World Headquarters. And he's a fantastic storyteller, but he has to be edited. <laughs> oh my goodness, the man had a mouth on him. And so um, luckily, JB knew how to edit. And without taking away from his personality, but that's how they, they are arranged, yeah. Wonderful. So, speaking of COVID, uh, let's talk about the Spanish flu. One of the articles included in Indelible Austin Volume 4 is the March 2020 article about the 1918 Spanish flu, and it received more than 700,000 views online. <coughs> and I remember reading it in the newspaper right at the beginning of the pandemic. So, please tell us about the process of writing that article and what reaction it, it received from readers. Uh, cool. Um... Well, I had known about the flu epidemic because it comes up in history, but also because there's uh, a wonderful play by Horton Foote called uh, 1918, and they made a movie of it, and I loved it. And so I had a sense of what the, the Spanish flu was like in Texas. And, but I didn't really understand until I dug into newspapers.com where you can see every edition of the American Statesman going back to 1871. And uh, it was easy to go through 1918 and 1919. And also it's searchable, so you can put in flu or influenza or whatever. And so uh, crises, as you know, as a journalist, uh, focus us. And, and we tend to uh, 
uh, speed up our process. So uh, even before South by Southwest was canceled that year, which was like the first big event in the country that was canceled, um, and I had to add that to the story at uh, the last minute. Um, but I had done all the research, so it was ready to go. And what I found was that the city knew about uh, social contact, about quarantining, about uh, masks, uh, knew about all the things that everybody was dealing with in 2020, and a lot of people were resisting. But we knew from 100 years previous exactly what was going to happen. Uh, and one of my follow-up stories, uh, the great, great, awesome writer, Larry Wright, wrote a novel. It's called Come October. And it came out like in May of 2020. So he had written it well before the pandemic. And it was about a pandemic that was exactly like COVID. And I said, how in the world did you know all that? Yeah. He said, got to do the research, Michael. But it turns <laughs> out he had been, I think, a magazine writer back when there was a, a single case in New Jersey of the Spanish flu coming back, okay. but that particular variety. Yeah. And so he got to know all the experts at CDC. And so he was already, he would already finished a novel uh, six or nine months before COVID began. And so it was all there waiting for us, you know. You know all the experts said, yeah, this is coming. Um, so speaking of Horton and Foot, in this book, I love the chapter, A Texas Book Returns Home, about how a copy of Horton Foot's Harrison, Texas made it back to its original owner. First, could you tell our audience about the time you met Horton Foot? who is a famous playwright and screenwriter who wrote The Trip to Bountiful and Tender Mercies, yep. among many other films and plays. And then if you could rush share the story about how the book made it back to June Fuller. Well, I had liked Horton Foote's plays since the 1970s and didn't really understand that he had been writing them since the late 40s. And almost all of them are set in small town Texas and they, uh, they're, and a lot of them are related to each other, so some of the same people pop up. And, you know, he grew up in Wharton, and he, uh, he paid attention. He was one of those little kids that listened to all the stories that the uh, uh, older people told. So he had a real sense of all the things that were going on in town, including the gossip. And so, uh, by the time I met him, you know, he'd already won multiple Academy Awards and was, you know, uh, very well established as our, our, our state's greatest playwright. And so, uh, luckily, um, the, the people who were running the State Theater down on, on Congress Avenue were going to name a small black box theater they were going to build after him. Oh, okay. And a, a local philanthropist was putting up the money. And so I was interviewing her about, you know, why name it after Horton Foote. And she said, would you like to meet him? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we drove down to Horton and into, uh, spent the day in his childhood home, which is a bungalow almost exactly like the bungalow I live in now in South Austin. And he just told stories and the walls were filled with pictures of his ancestors. And uh, we, it was, yeah, it was a treat beyond treats for, you know, that's the thing about us reporters is we have access to all kinds of things. And, and that's maybe our biggest uh, advantage is that we are given that kind of access. So um, uh, one of my favorite stories ever to write and report. So this other story came up. There was a woman whose mother, who was elderly, um, had uh, this amazing story. She'd grown up in Southeast Texas and the, the mother, and then moved to California in the 1950s. 
So she had, she, to explain to people that she met in the Bay Area in the, in the 50s, what her life was like, she would give them a copy, Horton's Foot, Horton Foot's Harrison, Texas, which um, was a collection of his short plays. So uh, this was her calling card to people. Now this was what it was really like, you know, not what they show in the movies. And so, uh, you know, years and years later, um, she's thinking of going, she's living up in, in East Texas near Henderson. And the, the Henderson community players were gonna do uh, uh, one of the important for the plays. And so she asked her daughter, could you locate me a copy of Harrison, Texas? You know, this book from the 1950s. So the daughter, of course, went online and found a copy instantly and gave it to her mother. And uh, mother opened it up. It was one of the copies she'd given away. <laughs> <laughs> I love that story so much because I just feel like it's a, it's a you know, they tell you you're in the right place. Um, so some of the chapters in your books are expanded versions of what appeared in The Statesman. So how do you decide what deserves a, like an expanded treatment? Well, sometimes things have happened in the interim that I'd like to get into the story. And sometimes there are things that, that my editor at The Statesman didn't want. Uh, and occasionally, um, there are probably about two of them in this book, there were stories that my editor didn't want at all. And, uh, and I said, you know, in my mind, uh, as a writer, you've gone through all this trouble of reporting and writing it. Well, what happens to it if your editor doesn't want it? Now, if you write for magazines, that happens to you all the time. <laughs> but for a newspaper, you expect all your stories to end up in print. So I held on to them, and I thought, well, I'll put them in the books. And, uh, and they're good. Yeah, they One of them that's in there about a murder at Moore's Crossing out uh, near where the airport is now uh, is uh, maybe revived in the paper because my current editor uh, <laughs> likes that kind of story. So. Wow. It's, uh, a, it's a true crime story. A true crime is having, is having a moment. I know, I know. <laughs> So you've chronicled the lives of many people in neighborhoods and communities all over Austin, people of many different backgrounds. So do their families sometimes come to you when a business is closing or someone is retiring, asking you to write a profile, or how do these personal features come about? For example, the end of an era on East 7th about Jose Ignacio Gutierrez, which I really like that one. Well, uh, stories come in all kinds of different ways. Um, I'll, I, I will talk about way that the profiles generally come about. Usually it's someone who is, say of my generation, who says, I, I have a great aunt, or I have uh, a grandfather, who, or a father who uh, has these great depression stories, or these stories about uh, being a, 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 you know, a pilot in World War II in uh, one of the, the Women's Air Corps. And, you know, knowing history and knowing what I've done and knowing what other people have done, I can pretty much pick out which ones are going to be rich and interesting and textured. And uh, in that particular case, it was a, a, a small scale pharmacist on, on, in East Austin. East 7th, East 7th? East 7th. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he was going out of business. And so he had a large family of children and and their representative contacted me and said, of course I'll go see you, you know. And, I, um, and it was just like a museum because nothing had changed since he opened in, 19, in the 1960s and whenever nothing had changed. And since I'd grown up in a little grocery store, I mean, some of the, the, the same cash registers and the, the little a, a TV set, black and white TV set, you know, I was like, wow, this is great. And I talked, I mean, he was interesting, and he also talked about the reasons for going out of business, that the insurance companies didn't want to deal with small pharmacies anymore, and, and then, of course, you know, all the online business and stuff like that, but he knew every customer's name and what they were taking, 
he also um, gave away uh, um, medicine to people who couldn't afford it. And so, and luckily, I had the backing of his um, children who also gave me stories, uh, wonderful stories, because he pulled out. He, he decided uh, he didn't want. Oh, no. you know, so we're going to go back and do another photo shoot or something like that. And he said, no, no, no. No, I got to go down to the valley. No, I, I, have, I have other things to do. Like, so I, I notice, I know what this is. I've gone through this many times where people just have go feet about being in the paper. And it has no idea what, it, what the story's going to look like. And, and his children, thankfully, read my stuff and knew that I, this was not going to be some kind of, of assassination or something. So um, I just made a decision that this time I was going to go, go through with it and just do it. Yeah. Because the problem was is he was in the early stages of dementia. so. His decision to back out, and he never said, I don't not, you know, don't do the story. I would, of course, not done it then. But his evasiveness was a signal to me. And, and his children said, I asked their permission. They said, go for it. Mm -hmm. And they got a great response. But I get a lot of those kinds of contacts. And what's most valuable to me is to have uh, uh, members of the younger generation who are my ambassadors. So I'll, I'll say, okay, I'll just go and see if this is a story. And I'll sit down with the potential subject and I'll just ask questions and listen, no notes. And then if I decide, yeah, this is rich and interesting and textured, I will go back uh, with a notebook and I write down just what they say okay. and not my other observations or thoughts so that I'm only writing down in their voice what, what's happening. And then I do some, I go back and I do some research and I talk to sometimes some experts and I try to relate that person's life to what was going on in Austin and the world and so forth. And then I get back to them through the intermediary and because I like to use email for this and I go, here's a checklist of facts and quotes from different places that I've been reporting, tell me if there are any errors in it. And so uh, that way I get it right. And if, if say for instance, the main source says, oh yeah, and then I met, uh, you know, uh, Butcher or Wilson or something, and I'm like, no, I don't think so. So uh, I, I just leave it out. I don't say that he claims to have met Butcher or Wilson. I just don't say it. And so then, once the story is told, uh, the, the, the greatest compliment I can get is, uh, thank you for letting me tell my story. So that with the subtext of which is, thank you for not getting in the way of, of with, by showing off your writing or. Yeah, no, I love that you're, it's their voice and then within that historical Framework. context. Yeah. yeah, and it's a wonderful tribute to him. You know? <coughs> I'm sure his family treasures that. So the quote at the front of the book is beautiful, but melancholy. It reads in part, once people are not here physically, the spiritual remains, we still connect. There is love after someone dies. Why did you select that quote, and what does it mean to you? Well, um, I don't know how many of you have done books, but that may be the hardest thing to pin down, is what quote I want <laughs> at the beginning. <laughs> And sometimes it's clear what the relationship is to the material in the book. Sometimes it's just a feeling. Okay. And uh, I ran across a Sandra Cisneros quote, uh, and I've always admired her writing, and I was like, that's how I often feel. It's like, uh, these lives are still here. And I'm not talking about ghosts. And, <laughs> We're talking about their presence is still with us, and they don't go away. And that's comforting, and it's also, I think, one of the reasons to have the, the books is so that they don't go away. This is permanent. Yes. It's 
as we can have in our culture. Yeah, yeah, uh, I understand. So when we worked together as a statesman back in the late 1990s, I remember that you would often take these long walks all over town. Do you still do this, and how has it helped you when writing your column? And I guess, uh, what do you miss most about old Austin, and what do you appreciate the most about how it has changed recently? That's a lot of questions, Michelle. Yeah, that's, right. <laughs> that's a lot of questions, I know. That's okay. Um, yes, I still walk, and uh, I'll walk home. You know, I live in Bolden. Uh, I took a lift here. Uh, I did with <laughs> uh, But uh, I found, well, when I moved to town as a grad student in 84, I didn't have a car. Oh, okay. So I discovered the city on foot, and the city on foot means the historic imprint of the city. So up to 45th Street and down to Old Torf or so, or maybe down to the Senate. And uh, when I first started writing theater reviews in 89, I still didn't have a car. <laughs> so I was like, walking a lot. <laughs> and what I found was that you, you always notice things that other people aren't noticing because you're on foot. And you also are meeting people like there's somebody um, in a rocky chair up on the front porch and they go and ask questions. I'm not an outgoing person, you know, I'm a shy person. But if I feel like this would be good for my reporting, okay. uh, I'll go ahead and, and, and not be as, as much of an introvert. So um, the uh, journalists like to see and hear and feel places and I'm affected by all of those things and the stories are affected by them especially topography. I mean, I, the number of times when you're on foot and you find out, oh, wow, all of a sudden there's an elevation here, I'm walking up. If you're in a car, you don't even notice. And you go, well, what was here before? Why is it, why is there, oh, there was a creek here before, and now it's all covered up, and it's underground. You know, you wouldn't notice that if you're in a car. But you asked about things I missed in old Austin and, and what I like about new Austin. Yeah. Well, you know, everybody has a long list of complaints about uh, <laughs> the golden age. Of, and, and in my experience, it's generally been uh, what you're talking about is you miss your youth. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because, yes, when I came here, you know, the concerts and the going out to the lake and just the crazy parties and all that. It's like, yeah, well, that's what happens in your 20s and 30s. Uh, now I like our garden and cooking and walking and just, you know. Uh, but it does affect the writing. It does affect the writing. And um, what I like about New Austin is all of the choices we have, the, the things that we can do that when I got here, they were not there. Right. You know, it was barbecue or, you know, <laughs> chicken fried steak. And so, um, and you get to meet all these people from the rest of the world. When I moved here, somebody told me, this is a sophisticated city in the sense that it's an educated city and then people travel so they know about the world, but it's not a cosmopolitan city, you mean a citizen of the world, and now it is. Thanks in part to South by Southwest and ACL and F1. Thanks in part to the high tech boom. We are now, you can go to a village in Kazakhstan and they're going to go, oh, ACL. <laughs> so, yeah. No, that's wonderful. And I hadn't thought of how, like you said, it's a cosmopolitan place now instead of just a place with people who, you know, who read a lot. Yeah, and I do want to make it clear because cosmopolitan has been drafted as a word that's negative in our political culture. But I just think that citizen of the world, caring about what happens in the rest of the world and being plugged into that. Uh, it's not about some elite. In fact, one of the city's contributions to the world culture has been an increasing number of nonprofits that are working far, far away from our boundaries. I mean, when I came here, it was still the old nonprofits that took care of orphans or the symphony or whatever. And, and now we have nonprofits now. One of them, the Miracle Foundation, 
which uh, started building uh, orphanages in India and then got into the business of consulting about them and they're consulting with the Catholic Church about how to run orphanages the best way. And that came out of Austin. Yeah. And there's, I, I could tell 50 stories like that. That's fascinating. So clearly journalism has changed a great deal during the last two decades. And uh, when we, you know, when I first got to know you, we didn't, we didn't have phones or Twitter or X or. So how does social media impact what you write or how you interact with readers? Well, we have a lot more direct interaction with, okay. with readers now. It, and it democratized the news okay. because everybody can find out everything at the same time with the devices. And so no longer are we the keepers of the kingdom or whatever. <laughs> We are just like everybody else, and uh, there is a great uh, uh, relief to that. Okay. That I mean, there are still a few people in town, and I ran across on social media a comment on one of my uh, uh, posts that was very, you know, just sweet and supportive of a, a, a theater company in town. And this person came back, and with with a comment that was like, well. I was the one who introduced that play to town. <laughs> it's like, really, at this point, you're looking for my <laughs> approval? You know, you don't need my approval, you know? Uh, so it's changed a lot. We, um, we learn a lot more quickly, and uh, what we do is disseminated, but, you know, I didn't know that story got 700,000 hits, I don't think. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> well, sometimes we don't pay attention. Um, but um, we're, we're in constant change in the newsroom and in the company, and you have to keep up with all those changes and roll with that. And, you know, I, I made no secret of, of, of having uh, problems with the hedge fund that owns us now, <laughs> but um, but I uh, I learned from a uh, the, the farewell message of one of our sports writers who's laid off a sports editor, and he said, "Remember, he came from a newspaper family. Uh, remember, a company doesn't own a newspaper; a community does." Oh, I love that. Yes. So. Please tell us about Indelible Austin, Volume 5. I know that is just almost, almost done. And um, if you could just tell us when that will be coming out, and what are you excited about uh, that you're currently working on that you'd like to share? Sure. Well, Volume 5 um, is days or weeks away from going to the printer. Um, it has uh, a few hoops to go through. Uh, there's still a lot of work to do um, in terms of like the index, which is the last thing that's done. I don't think people know that, but you got to have the whole rest of the book as it's in the form that it's going to be before you start the index. Okay. Well, a lot of you know that. I'm sure you're a bookish crowd. But um, I, I am very lucky to have an in-house index builder in my husband, so <laughs> it is hellish work. <laughs> but he does it. I mean, he, was a book editor, so, uh, and uh, now that he's retired, he has the time. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, we're hoping to have it out by time of, of the Texas Book Festival, okay. and every time we, we have a, a volume, that's our goal, is get it out by the Book Festival, and every time it's like right at the last minute, okay. so I can't, I can't guarantee that it'll be out. What, what part of the plan, since there are five volumes, is to do a box set. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience before we start the Q&A? Well, you asked about what I'm working on. Yeah, yeah. And I just want to say um, that I work on a lot of different subjects, and so, and I have the permission to do things as long as they're interesting and they think that people will read them. So I just, uh, yesterday, um, we published a story that was close to my heart uh, about uh, Texas exotic mammals. And, uh, 
it, uh, it had been in the back of my head for decades. I'd read it in the 1994 edition of Mammals of Texas about how these, um, 94 years, how these um, imports, they began importing for game originally, uh, antelope and um, other things back in the 1920s in Texas, and you know, our, our diverse landscape supported that. Well, so well that uh, now tens of thousands of them roam free. So, but nobody at Parks and Wildlife wanted to talk about that. And so that, if you're a reporter, you know, if they don't want to talk about it, there's a story there. <laughs> so I just kept pushing slowly, and I found two fantastic scientists out of Texas Tech who would talk to me about it. And then another scientist who'd been the president of three universities, and then finally, uh, we needed pictures, so we went up to Fossil Rim uh, Wildlife Center in Glen Rose, Texas, which is about three hours north of here. And uh, I was able to talk to the, the man who's in charge of the animals, of animal care, and he turned out to be a great interview. And so the story came out, and now, uh, you know, it acknowledges that we haven't had a, a count of, of these free range uh, exotics since 94. Oh, wow. In part because of whatever tension there is between parks and wildlife and the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which has primary regulatory control over them because they are livestock. So that was why they were not talking to me. So, anyway, uh, so every story. Yeah. that I do is something yeah. that is a part of a passion project. Yeah. And uh, today this column came out, an Austin Answer column on the Economy Furniture Company uh, strike of 1968, 69 through 68 through 71. I know it was result in 71. But I had been hearing about that from uh, Mexican-American leaders forever, that this was the galvanizing event of the political life of Hispanics in the city. And I hadn't had a chance to write about it in depth, but all of you know, I get a call from the person who had put together a monument over in East Austin that will be unveiled in a few days. And so I was able to dig deeper into that story and uh, find out just, because I had interviewed all of the civil rights leaders, you know, who, who were who were elected as the first Hispanic, as the first Hispanic, that all of them used those strikers as workers on their campaigns. Okay. Richard Moya, uh, John Trevino, all of them. So I knew it from their point of view, but I didn't know it from the strikers' point of view, and so we got that in the story. Those sound incredible. So we're at the Q&A portion of our event. Um, please raise your hand if you have a question, and we will bring you the microphone. Michael, uh, what would be on your list of uh, Austin treasures? Uh, some besides like uh, Barton Springs or the Moonlight Towers, if they're still around, what would be on your list? Maybe something obscure. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, there's so much, and it's hard to pick something out. I will say something that maybe doesn't get enough credit, and every time I'm on it, I think this is a thing that ties the whole city together, and that's the 10-mile trail around the lake, which is called the Roy and Ann Butler Hike and Bike Trail. And uh, so it, 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 it goes from the hills, which we called on early maps, the Colorado Mountains, <laughs> all the way out into the Black Line Prairies east of town. It encompasses every kind of neighborhood. It, uh, is, it shows you constantly new views of your city. Um, when I remember when they put in that boardwalk for the first time, and I was out on it, and I was just going, I don't recognize my city. <laughs> this is great. There's lots of wildlife. There's lots of history. There's a lot of, uh, I, I toured yesterday a, um, 
hidden part of Roy Guerrero Park with a guy who's written a fantastic book called uh, The Natural History of Empty Lots. Chris Brown is his name. He's the next great Austin author. And uh, everywhere he goes, he notices the kinds of things that I like to notice of how this industrial landscape has been rewilded or how um, things have been incorporated into the way that humans live and, and yet there's nature and he gives a very positive message. I mean, you know, in a time of climate change, you know, it should bring us closer to nature and observe changes and observe success stories. You know, um, the, the, the place that, that he was taking me around had been uh, a horrible um, informal garbage dump for decades in the Montopolis area. And uh, a ecology action ecology uh, took it over and, and cleaned up the brownfield, and all these things are growing. And uh, right next to them, eight hundred year old oaks. So, uh, so the trail is is a treasure that I, I don't think we appreciate enough. Other questions? First of all, I absolutely love the way that you uh, make connections with uh, these makers of history um, and just listen to their stories. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, secondly, uh, what was the name of the book that you mentioned that was written by Larry White, I believe? And also, uh, I live in Mueller. What might be interesting about that particular neighborhood that I find fascinating? Okay, which neighborhood are we talking about? Uh, Miller? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Miller, 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 Miller. Um, I say Miller. Uh, I, I, you know, it's a German name, and U-E is it. <laughs> but um, I think one of the things that's interesting about it is that it's, it's a big surprise when you go there. Uh, it was a big surprise when it was an airport. Um, because it's high up, it's higher up than you think. And of course, you, if you look at the name of the neighborhood on the other side of Interstate 35, it's Highlands. And you go, how high is that? That's not very high. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it seems like it's the same height as Hyde Park. You know, what is it? My very first house here in Austin, the very first rental, was right next to the airport, just north of it. And believe me, our walls shook every time a plane came in. But we, it was cheap, we were students. But um, the land, um, a lot of it was owned by, um, I'm gonna, Albert Collins, I think is his first name, Albert Collins, the ancestor of Ada Collins Anderson, who was one of our great civil rights leaders. So it was an independent African-American landowner who owned most of that land. And uh, part of his story, sadly, is that he was enslaved twice. It's also land where the, the, there was a famous scalping incident that has been overblown in history books, uh, the Wilbarger uh, incident. And so it's an interesting uh, piece of land, and now it's this um, new urbanist project, and the names of the streets were all come up by, uh, made up by a committee. In fact, I'm going to do a story soon about where all those street names came from. Uh, of famous Austin people who never had a street name after them, so like <laughs> Zach Scott and people like that. Uh, Grandma Camacho. Oh, cool. So, uh, uh, so yeah, I was there just a week ago, and I was astounded first by the traffic, uh, and and the restaurant we went to is in New Curvy Lane over there. Uh, it's giant, and it doesn't look like 
any of the other curvy lanes. And right across the street was this farmer's market. I was like, what city am I in? <laughs> to Seattle is what? Fantastically diverse uh, pedestrian population there. Um, and it just seemed like uh, a reborn city on this land that had so much history. And the Larry Wright book was the pandemic was the call. Uh, come October. Okay. Come October. And it's kind of like a scientific fantasy book. Um, but it turns out it's based on reality. <laughs> Next question. One moment to make my way over here. Thank you for your time. I've actually been here longer than you have, but uh, <laughs> uh, I recently went to a presentation about the uh, collapse of the Austin Dam in 1900 and some Somebody, I want to know who wants to know about Reed Park because uh, I have something in that regard. But my question to you is Has there been any study or any real analysis of uh, my perception was that Austin must have languished for 10, maybe 15, maybe 20 years after the dam collapse because that, uh, you know, was it, it was uh, the product was. We're going to be a industrial center. We're going to have all this um, uh, constant level lake, and we're going to have electricity, and we're going to have this <coughs> influx of, um, of people and money, et cetera, et cetera. We washed away. We don't have the people. We don't have the electricity. We don't have a constant uh, supply of water. We don't even have a way of getting across the river. <laughs> I'm wondering, did did Austin, in fact, languish for those years, or do you have any information? Oh, yes, it did. And, and it was not the first time or the last time. Um, it, it, I counted among the 10 biggest turning points in Austin history, uh, the collapse of the dam, uh, because indeed, uh, the, the city leaders wanted to make us into the Pittsburgh of the Southwest. That was their slogan. And so, um, we dodged that bullet, and so. Uh, uh, but but let's consider some of the other times um, uh, when uh, you know becoming the capital is a turning point. But then just a couple of years later, um, President Houston, who was reelected, came in and said, "I don't like this place. And let's go back to Houston." And uh, so the city just emptied out. It was down to 200 people. And, and as one of my recent stories, or a couple of my recent stories indicated, the city was saved by the Tonkawa, yeah. who moved into the city and camped near Republic Square Park, and doubling the size of the population of the hamlet. <laughs> and so for uh, maybe 18 months, it was the Tonkawa who sustained us. And luckily, luckily this Thursday, city and county officials and cultural leaders are going to be thanking the Tonkawa for that uh, at Republic Square Park and Meshikarki Museum and at the City Hall. So um, that was one time. And then the Civil War, it just emptied out. It was so far away from all the action, so far away from everything. And the, the state capital at that time was like the size of a county courthouse. It looks like one, looked like one. And finally, as the Union troops began to, to threaten somewhat, Texas coming up from the Rio Grande, uh, Galveston, Red River, um, they built three forts, um, which I've explored in, on, in several columns. And, but yeah, to protect what? You know, there were hardly anybody here. In this particular case, with the dam, is that no, we did not become, uh, and, and for those of you who don't know, they made the dam out of um, blocks of granite that were the same that were uh, mined to make the state capital behind us. So, and what the engineers did not take into account, which, you know, historians didn't take into account, is a variable uh, uh, flow river. So sometimes 
it's, it was so narrow you could walk across it. But at other times, it's a huge, roaring flood. And the, as you know, because you just saw uh, some demonstration on it, but um, yeah, the silting underneath it was, was weakening it all along, and then the big storm came in 1900 and washed it away. A clever, clever city leader said, you know, we're not going to be a manufacturing center. <laughs> so we don't have any energy. We don't have significant coal supplies or anything. So uh, what we became is the home city or city of homes. So what they make, we have two engines of our economy, and that was the state government and the university. So we're going to encourage this circle of leafy neighborhoods close in, we're gonna have uh, uh, streetcars to get people from place to place. All of the commerce will be done downtown. Uh, we'll have some manufacturing, and by the way, on the west side as well as the east side, because we had trains by then. But we're not gonna be the Pittsburgh or the Southwest. And in fact, we're still living in that city, the home city. We are still fighting to uh, protect or improve or, uh, these central Austin neighborhoods uh, and that were an early 19th century uh, invention. Thank you. We have about 10 minutes. Do we have time for one more question? Michelle? Yeah, yeah. I'm not going. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, you mentioned three of the biggest turning points in Austin's history, the uh, being named the capital, the Civil War, the dam collapse. What are the other seven? <laughs> well, there you go. Um, I get cold on it right away. Number one, uh, the arrival of humans 20,000 years ago. And we know about when they arrived because of the dating of artifacts at the Gulf site on the border of Bell and Williamson counties. Uh, that's slightly controversial, saying it goes back 20,000 years. I mean, there's still archaeologists that uh, will disagree with that, but our archaeologists up at the Gulf side say 20,000 years. Uh, so number two, uh, the arrival of the Spanish 500 years ago, or Europeans and Africans. And uh, they really didn't have a direct impact on the city because the Spanish never really colonized this part of the state. And let's face something, the Spanish never controlled Texas. Uh, Mexico never controlled Texas. They controlled tiny little presidios and missions and the, the villitas, um, but they did not control Texas. And the only remnant we have from the Spanish period in Austin is in 1730, um, there were three missions that temporarily were on the Colorado River in the Austin area. Now there's a monument to them in uh, Barton Springs, but there's no archeological evidence that those missions were at Barton Springs. And in fact, yesterday I was in a region of Montopolis on this hike with the guy, Chris Brown, and we we're talking about our fun adventures looking for remnants of Spanish missions. We haven't found them. Barton um, Creek Corral, you wrote about Barton Creek Corral. Yes. And so then number three would be the arrival of the Anglo-Americans and African-Americans in the 1820s. And they loved Austin. Um, uh, Stephen F. Austin, we finally determined, did want to retire here at Laguna Gloria. And uh, a history buff, Lanny Audison, who is one of the greatest uh, researchers in town uh, has proven that, that that's where he wanted to, to get away from everybody and have a sheep farm. Uh, so then I would say the next turning point is when we became the capital in, in 1839. I would say the Civil War wasn't as much as a, 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 a turning point as what came after it because immediately afterwards we had two developments the establishment of freedom colonies from the emancipated slaves, independent land-owning African-Americans uh, who were 
rejected the idea of being a sharecropper back on the plantation or a domestic or laborer in the city. They created these semi-rural pockets all around Austin, which um, I live in one in Boulder. Uh, and, uh, and there are still African-American families um, whose ancestors go back to the 1870s in my neighborhood. But at the same time, we got the railroad in 1871, Christmas Day. And it allowed us to be connected to the rest of the world and to bring in luxury goods and building supplies and to send out our whatever we made at that time. By that time, they learned how to, to cultivate cotton on the Blackland Prairies. So the first merchants in town were, were uh, cotton traders. So, uh, and then the next turning point would be UT in 1883-84. And that changed everything else. Everything else that came afterwards, all the turning points came because of UT. Uh, it just changed our whole culture. Uh, then the dam <laughs> collapsing in 1900. I would say the next thing, and this is directly related to UT, was the um, uh, establishment of the Balcones Research Center in an old magnesium plant in my uh, north of town. It had been a magnesium plant uh, during World War II, and then when it was over, we had all these buildings and you know uh, other things out there. And uh, engineers with UT said, "Can we have it?" And luckily, we had a pretty good congressman named LBJ who made it happen. And our high-tech industry all came out those research facilities. That's where Tracor started, that's where National Instruments started, that's where uh, uh, IBM landed when they came to town. All these other companies, and still now, a lot of the tech companies are out there in the domain area, uh, which is just north of, of the, now the Pickle Research Center. I'm getting there, uh, I'll get there before um, the next thing I would say is in the 70s, the, the uh, rise of a, a, a unique Austin culture, uh, a culture, I think if you came here in the 50s, and some of you may have, you may have already been here, um, a lot of Austin was alike a lot of the other rest of the country, you know, it was, there, there yes, there were beautiful lakes, Green Hills, there was the university, there was the leafy neighborhoods. But there wasn't like something that people recognize as Austin culture if you were from somewhere else. But in the 70s, you get as a spillover from the student protests, the anti Vietnam War movement allied with the women's movement, the gay movement, the green movement the labor movement, the civil rights movement, and created the progressive political culture that still dominates our city. It fights all the time within itself, but it, it all came at, around 1975. At the same time, we had the Armadillo World Headquarters, we had the music scene, we had authors <coughs> moving here who defined who we are, um, and and following that, movie makers, artists, the dining scene, all of that is closely associated to who we are, and all of that really came to get gelled in the 70s. And finally, and this is something that only I say, I don't think other people say, but I, I think the 21st century has been the, the age of the nonprofits. I think nonprofits here in town, which as I said earlier, so long, sleepy and old-fashioned, and you know something out of Dickens and <laughs> Bleak House. Uh, but now, uh, and, and, and no, no disrespect because they did the, the Lord's work, but uh, but now we have all of these nonprofits, thousands and thousands of them, doing all this crucial work in our city. There's these conservancies, like the Waterloo Conservancy and the Trail Conservancy all of them uh, and so basically it's letting the people get back in and, and get their hands dirty and take care of the business that the government can't do because it's so tied up in so many ways with uh, division and paperwork red tape and stuff like that 
So I'm a big fan of the nonprofits in town, and they have their problems. But I feel like we're in a golden age of nonprofits. And that's my little story. <laughs> that's wonderful. Y'all, please join me in thanking Michael for joining us today. So save the date, we will have another author session on October 7th with Dave Dalton Thomas, our mutual friend who's going to come discuss his book about Willie Nelson's Fourth of July picnics. Um, so Michael is available to sign books, and if you'd like to view some items from our archives collection, including the 1903 and 1929 Austin City Directory, uh, Peggy Price is happy to show you these and answer any questions you have about our archives. Um, but yeah, thank you.